Well, good morning and happy Easter. Christ is risen. Um, and um, if you're not familiar with it, um, kind of right here at the beginning, we're going to we're going to do something. But there is um, uh, I'm. I want to call it more of a habit than a tradition, but there's sort of a habit in Christian churches, and this is something that churches do all around the world on Easter Sunday. Um, people will do it to one another, but we'll also do it um, kind of in the context of worship. But, but one person will walk up to another and will say, he is risen, and the reply is, he is risen indeed. Um, so I want, to give us, I want us to give that a try um, right now. So, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Fantastic. Um, so why, why do you think we would say that to each other? Um, why would, oh, wow. My, my iPad's changing pages and I'm not touching it. Um, <laughs> so this might be real fun. Um, but why do you think we say that to each other? Um, I mean, certainly we say it because um, it's true. It's what we believe. It's what we celebrate today, that Christ is, is risen. Um, but I also think we, we say it um, because it's almost too incredible to believe. We repeat to one another that Christ is risen because we need to be reminded that he has really done that. Jesus was dead and now he is alive. That's the foundation of our hope. It's the reason that we actually meet together for worship on Sunday mornings. Um, if, you, if you look in the Bible in the Old Testament, um, the, the, the day of worship for God's people that's laid out in the Ten Commandments is the Sabbath day, which is Saturday. Um, we meet on Sundays, the Lord's Day. Um, and it's, the reason we do that is because it was on a Sunday, when the Bible says the first day of the week, um, on a Sunday morning, that's when Jesus rose from the grave. Right? And that changes everything. It changes how we as Christians worship that we gather together in the morning on the first day of the week. Because that was when Jesus rose from the grave. That's when the victory of heaven was actually made known to us, when it was revealed to us what God had done. And so we need to remember that amazing thing that has happened. We need to remember the miracle of what God has done for us. And so we say, he is risen well done. Um, <laughs> and so this morning, we're going um, to we're gonna look at the account of the resurrection from the Gospel of Luke, um, which is in chapter 24, um, which begins on page 884 in the, in the Pew Bibles, if you have one of those. Um, and we're going to look at the first 12 verses of, of that chapter. Um, so this is, um, so Luke is um, one of the gospel writers, there are, there are four gospels in the New Testament, so four people who, who wrote an account of the life and the ministry of Jesus. And so Luke, this is his account of the resurrection. Um, and so as I, as I read, um, follow along in, um, in the Pew Bibles and hear this good news that Christ is risen. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for this, your word, and we thank you for this time that we have together this morning. Um, Father, as we look at these verses, may you speak to our hearts. Give us ears to hear and hearts to believe the good news of your gospel, that Christ is risen. In his name we pray. 
Amen. So there's a, um, there's a radio program in, in the U.S. called This American Life, which I feel like once I tell you that, that it's called This American Life, I don't need to tell you um, that it's a radio program in the U.S. Um, it's on public radio in the States, um, and it is available in the U.K. Um, as a podcast. And it's sort of this long format journalism kind of a, a radio show. And so each episode tells multiple stories that are usually tied together by, by a common theme. And so I was just, I was listening to an episode this week. It's not the most recent one. It's from a few weeks ago, but uh, I listened to an episode this week that was titled Unprepared for What Has Already Happened. Um, I almost used that whole thing as the title for my sermon because that's really what's going on here, that, that this is a story about people who are unprepared for what has already happened. Uh, but on this episode, the first story, the first story in the episode is about a guy named Jackson Landers. And Jackson lives in Virginia um, in the U.S. He's an avid outdoorsman. He's also a journalist who writes about hunting and fishing. And, um, and he tells this story that one day he was, he's getting ready to go out and go fishing. And he puts on his, his water shoes and he, he puts his foot into the shoe. He feels a sting. Um, and he pulls his foot out and he shakes out his shoe and discovers that he's been, bl- he's been bitten by a black widow spider. Um, and so almost immediately, like his mind is just sort of racing because he's sort of overwhelmed by, by all these things he knows and then what he's, and what he's really prepared to believe about his situation. So as an experienced outdoorsman, Jackson knows that black widow bites are, are almost never fatal. Um, he also knows that they can be incredibly painful, like doubled over on the ground, you know, just writhing in pain, kind of painful. He also knows that the people who have the worst reactions to black widow bites are usually the people who don't get medical attention right away. But then he also knows that if you go to the hospital, mostly what they're going to do is give you pain medication. There's there's an anti-venom, but there's there's actually a higher risk that you could have a reaction to the anti-venom and die from that. Um, That's more likely than dying from the spider bite. So oftentimes they won't even give you the anti-venom because of the risk. And so knowing all of these things, he decides to continue fishing, (laughs) right? Like he knows he's been bitten by a black widow. He knows that he should go to the hospital and he goes fishing anyway. And so pretty soon he starts to feel kind of this tightness in his stomach and he describes it as like someone just punching him in the stomach. And he puts up with that for a little while. And finally decides, all right, it gets bad enough that he's like, he packs up his stuff and he's like, all right, I need to leave. Um, But he doesn't go to the hospital. He goes home. He's like, what are they? They're just going to give me pain meds at the hospital. I'll just go home. Um, So he goes home. Um, He said he did when he got home. He sort of put a post on Facebook that just is like, hey, if no one hears from me for a while, I got bit by a black widow and I'm I'm at home on the floor writhing in pain. Um, And he just was like, ha ha, and sent that out. Um, but he said pretty soon it got to the point where he really couldn't handle this pain anymore. He said it felt like his chest was being squeezed in a vice. Um, so finally, eventually, he called his mom and she had to drive him to the hospital because at this point he can't take care of himself. He can't get himself to the hospital. Um, he gets there and it turns out that there is actually a newer anti-venom um, and a safer one. And they give that to him and almost immediately he starts to recover. But as he tells his story... He says that the hardest part was accepting that things had changed. He said after he'd been bitten, everything looked and felt the same. He said it just, it felt like a bee sting, right? It it was a little, little sting and that was it. The sun was still shining and everything looks good and it feels the same. And he said, when everything looks the same, it's difficult to accept that reality has just changed, that things are about to be really, really different. Jackson was unprepared for what had already happened, right? Like this event had already taken place and he was struggling to catch up to the fact that reality had changed, that things had changed. And so that's how we find Jesus' disciples on Easter morning. They're unprepared for what has already happened. This story begins with women going to the tomb of Jesus. And by the time they get there, the tomb is empty. The resurrection has already happened. 
Right? We don't read about Jesus stepping out of the tomb. We read about an empty tomb. This thing has already happened, but everything looks and feels the same. And so they're not ready to accept that reality has just changed. And here's the thing. The resurrection always comes to people who aren't ready. And so this morning, we're going to look at three aspects of how Jesus died and rose again for people who aren't ready, who aren't ready to accept that things have changed. And so Jesus died and rose again for people who abandon him. And Jesus died and rose again for people who forget his promises. And Jesus died and rose again for people who doubt his, mess- his messengers. And so first, Jesus died and rose again for people who abandon him. On Easter morning, the disciples have gone into hiding. I mean, they watched in disbelief on Good Friday as Jesus died. They believed that he was the Messiah, that he was the Savior, that he was going to set everything to right. And now he's gone. And when things got hard, they denied knowing him. They hid their faces. They ran away. And why? Why do you think that they would do that? Well, because they're scared. Because they thought they might be next. I mean, after all, if the religious leaders could kill Jesus, then what would stop them from killing his followers, from killing his disciples? I mean, we can understand why they were scared. And even these women who come to Jesus' grave, they're not coming because they expect the resurrection. They're coming with spices to anoint his dead body. Jesus died on Friday, and that's the day before the Sabbath, the Jewish Sabbath. And so his body had to be taken down from the cross and had to be put in the tomb before sundown because the Sabbath starts at sundown. So he has to be put into the tomb somewhat hastily. And then after that, nothing can be done on Saturday. And so on Sunday, the women can finally come and treat Jesus with the dignity that, and, and the love that, that, they, that, that they know he deserves. They can finally come and they can remove the mud and the blood and the filth from Jesus's body. They plan to wash him lovingly and to anoint him with burial spices. And to be sure, when they come to do this, they're coming out of their love for Jesus. But they aren't necessarily coming in faith. And what I mean by that is that they're not expecting the resurrection. They're coming to say goodbye. And even in doing that, they're they're unprepared. Jesus' tomb was sealed with a large stone, and these women have no way of moving it. And we can understand what they're going through. They're grieving. They're distraught. And even their best efforts to say goodbye are insufficient because they can't get to the place where they think he is. And so these these women, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and and these other women, they come. They come looking for the wrong thing in the wrong place and for the wrong reason, right? Because they're looking for a dead Jesus. And they're looking for him in a tomb. And they're coming so that they can say goodbye. Goodbye. And the resurrection is for them. It can be easy for us to live our lives as if the resurrection never really happened. We might come to church on a Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, we live wholly and completely for ourselves. We might count on Jesus for our eternal life, and yet we see him as irrelevant to our daily lives. We can come looking for Jesus to fill us up on Sunday. And then we abandon him the rest of the week. And even if we do all of that, if we come to Jesus looking for the wrong thing, looking in the wrong place and looking for the wrong reason, the resurrection is still for us. Jesus died and rose again for people who abandoned him. And he also died and rose again for people who forget his promises. (laughs) 
As soon as the women arrive at the tomb, the stone is already rolled away. The tomb is empty. And we can imagine how disorienting this would have been for them. I mean, John writes in his gospel that Mary Magdalene wept because she thought that Jesus' body had been stolen. And in the midst of this grief and confusion, these two women are, are they're met by angels. Um, Luke describes them as, as men in dazzling apparel. Um, these, are, these are angels. The other gospel accounts tell us that these are angels who come and they say, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. And then they say, remember how he told you when he was still with you in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And then Luke tells us that at that point, they remembered Jesus' words. I mean, during his earthly ministry, Jesus had been very clear about the necessity of his death and resurrection. He had told his disciples about this, that this would happen. And every single one of them forgot They forgot his promises. They forgot maybe the most important thing that he had told them. And still, the resurrection was for them. And so how do we forget God's promises? I mean, when when life is stressful and busy, do we remember God's promises? Philippians 4 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Right? So in other words, when you're really, really stressed and you feel overwhelmed, pray and God will give you his peace. But when I'm feeling stressed and anxious and overwhelmed, It's really hard for me to remember that. It's easy for me to think, well, I don't have time to pray. I have too much stuff to do. I mean, that that happened for me this this week as we're coming up to a very busy weekend with lots of things going on. Um, My wife, Liz, said we should should sit down and pray. And, And my first thought was, I don't have time to do that. And then I realized I couldn't say that out loud. And so we sat down and we prayed. And God actually did. Give me his peace. What about when we feel the heavy weight of, of loss? Right? The, the loss of a job or of a relationship, the loss of a loved one or the diagnosis of, of a terrible illness. When Hebrews 13, God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And yet in those moments, we might feel forsaken. We might feel alone. And even when we forget God's promises, the resurrection is for us. In fact, better yet, especially, especially when we forget God's promises, Jesus died and rose again for us. When finally Jesus died and rose again for people who doubt his messengers, after seeing the empty tomb and meeting the angels, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, these, these, these other women, they race back and they tell the apostles what has happened. And how do they respond? Do they praise God for this wonderful news? Do they all of a sudden remember the promises of Jesus and connect all the dots and go, oh yeah, he said he, said he was going to do that. Do they thank the women for bringing this testimony? No, hey, they don't do any of these things. Luke says that they don't believe the women. And I'm re- I realized as I read this this morning that I, in my notes, I used a different translation. I don't know how that happened, but I did. Um, so what I'm going to say now is based on, I think maybe it's the NIV is what I ended up using. Um, but Luke says that they didn't believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Um, right in, in our pew Bibles, it says, um, it seemed like an idle tale. It seemed like nonsense. Now we could sort of zero in on this verse and we could just have a whole conversation about mansplaining and about kind of just the long history of men not listening to women, not believing women. Um, And those are real things. Those are things that still happen. Um, They're things that I do. And there probably is some of that happening here. But I don't think that's the main point. 
of what's going on here. That's not the main thing that's happening here. Um, because first of all, God honors these women by making them the first witnesses to the resurrection. Even if the men don't get it and don't believe them, God gives these women a very particular honor. He makes them the first witnesses to his resurrection. But more than that, their message just seems too incredible to believe. I mean, the apostles believe in resurrection, but what they believed in was a general resurrection on the day of judgment, at the end of all things, when God finally establishes his kingdom on earth forever, at that point, everyone who has died will be raised and will face either eternal punishment or eternal life. And as Christians, that is, that is still what we believe. But nothing in that actually anticipates an individual resurrection, the resurrection of one guy. So even when Jesus talked about this to his, his disciples, they put it in this category of like, oh well, yeah, I mean, at the end, of course, you're going to be resurrected when everyone is. They didn't get what Jesus was saying. He said, no, I will rise again. As Richard said earlier, it's, it's, it's the promise of what God will do later for all of us. But they just didn't have a category for the resurrection of the Messiah. And so to them, it sounded like nonsense. And honestly, the resurrection does sound like nonsense. I mean, this is, this is what we talked about in the Apostles' Creed, that the God of the whole universe, the one who made everything, became a man, a real human being man, that he lived a righteous and perfect life. Even, even though he had done that, he died as a criminal. And then he rose from the dead to defeat the power of death forever. That's a hard thing to believe. In fact, it's an impossible thing to believe without the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. I grew up in, in the southern United States, uh, mostly in Alabama, um, the state of Alabama, which is very much a church-going culture. So I grew up going to church um, somewhat sporadically with my mom. Um, uh, neither of us were Christians. She wasn't Christian. I wasn't Christian. But, but being in the South, you just you sort of you go to church. And so we moved around a lot. But every time we moved, we'd, we'd visit a church for a while. And it was always a Methodist church. Um, that's why we sang the Gloria Patri this morning, because I just heard that a ton in Methodist churches growing up, and um, I enjoy singing it from time to time, um, especially now, because the words mean something to me. Um, in those churches, we would recite the Apostles' Creed every week. And so by the time I was 12 years old, I could easily recite the Apostles' Creed from memory. Now, if I do it from memory, it involves phrases like the quick and the dead and the Holy Ghost, um, instead of living and dead and Holy Spirit, but, but I, could, I could say it from memory, but it sounded like nonsense to me. I didn't know what it meant. As a teenager, I would regularly go to youth groups with my friends. Um, I had tons of friends who would invite me to come to church with them and, and would go to their youth group. And in these, in these youth groups, I heard the gospel proclaimed over and over and over again. I mean, several times I had youth leaders who would sit down and meet with me and they would directly explain the gospel to me and what it means. And still, it sounded like nonsense to me. I didn't have a category to put it into. It wasn't until the Holy Spirit moved in my heart and gave me faith to believe that I became a Christian. It wasn't until, um, until God actually brought me to that point of faith that I was able to believe the message of the resurrection. And yet, as many times as I doubted God's messengers, Jesus still died and rose for me. See, even when the apostles doubted the women, Jesus died and rose for them. And many of us have spent years praying for friends and family um, who aren't Christian, who don't yet know Jesus. And the resurrection is also for them. That's why we keep praying. That's why we keep telling them about Jesus. Because even if it sounds like nonsense, Jesus really did this thing. He really died and rose again. And the truth is, we're still unprepared for what has already happened. Um, 
A scholar named N.T. Wright says that the gospel is good news, not least because it dares to tell us things we didn't expect, weren't inclined to believe, and couldn't understand. And another minister named J.C. Ryle, he, he says that the way we move beyond our own dullness of faith, right, our, our own ability, our, our own inability to believe this nonsense is to get deeper love towards Christ. And I think that's what we see Peter doing at the end of this passage. I mean, throughout the Gospels, Peter is consistently an act first and think later kind of a guy. Um, we see him do that again and again and again. Like he just, he acts, he does stuff. And he thinks about it later. Um, sometimes there are amazing acts of faith. Sometimes Peter does some really dumb stuff. Um, but that's what we see here. He doesn't understand what these women have said but he loves Jesus. And so he looks for the truth by going to look for Jesus. The resurrection has already happened. Jesus has already died and rose again for Peter. And what we see in these verses is that the resurrection doesn't come as some kind of a reward for the faithful, right? The disciples can't pat themselves on the back and say, we believed when everyone else doubted. And we stood by Jesus when everyone else ran away. I like, know they doubted. They ran away. They forgot some of the most important things that Jesus said to them. And still Jesus died and rose for them. And so that means that Jesus can handle our doubts. He welcomes our questions. He's patient with us. The resurrection isn't a reward for the faithful. It's not given to people who have somehow gotten everything right. It's a gift for people who desperately need it. Jesus died and rose again for people who abandon him, for people who forget his promises, and for people who doubt his messengers. And like Peter, those who run to Jesus will always find him. And so we're going to do this one more time. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. Please pray with me.